The basic mayfly life cycle sees the egg develop to a nymph, the nymph growing and maturing in the aquatic environment before hatching. Nymphs emerge either drifting upward through the water column or by crawling out on rocks. A mayfly exits its nymphal casing by cracking through the wing pad, drying its wings before flying away to streamside vegetation. What most anglers don't see is the done molting to a spinner as it either sits in the bush or mid-air, often at night or low light conditions. Spinner bodies have elongated tails, larger and translucent wings, and the body elongates and changes color at least slightly. Spinners usually appear larger than they actually are. They are seldom thick or stout. Start by matching body size and color tone, then thickness, before worrying about the total length with wings and tails included. The reality is that the wings and tail may never be on the water nor seen and may not be a consideration to a trout, whereas a body and legs will always be on the water and seen. Spinner abdomens are most commonly a shade of brown or tan and in sizes 14 through 20. Because of these new characteristics, spinners are susceptible to heat and drying out. It protects itself by remaining in cool, shaded areas, returning to the water only in low light of cloudy days, early mornings, or late evenings at the peak of summer. It's the spinner that mates and returns to the water to lay eggs and expire. Spinners in the air late afternoon to early evening almost always mean spinners on the water at dusk. Look in the streamside bushes for signs of imminent swarms. While a hatch may be one to five hours, the spinner event generally is short, about 20 to 90 minutes. This means concentrations of insects can be heavy and your fly one of literally a million on the water in a compressed time frame. Light to moderate events are more productive than heavy events. Being one of a hundred instead of one in a million is simply an odds game. While heavy events can raise every fish in the river, it often means you get to watch every fish in the river not eat your fly. Trout may begin the event by focusing on the newly spent spinner that has an upright wing. As the evening unfolds, they may focus solely on splayed wing spinners or even upright wing spent spinners that have simply fallen over in the surface film. Feeding trout can become extremely picky and locked on to one insect and size. A dip net may be beneficial to show the diversity of what's on the water, but be warned that dip nets can also add to your anxiety as you might find five or six insects or various insect stages on the water and only have 20 minutes of fishable light left. It often isn't the biggest nor most abundant insects on the water trout lock into. It might be which are most susceptible and least likely to fly away, allowing trout to leisurely sip. So it's the peak of summer and uh, there's some long hot days out here. And you might not want to go to the river in waders, you might just want a wet wade. But what you got to keep in mind is that by the time you get to the river, you're probably going to sweat a little and what happens is because you're laid out into the evening, 10, 11 o'clock at night, you're going to end up shivering. So it's actually a really good idea to come along with either a light fleece, um, some sort of long sleeve to cover up with and maybe even a pair of uh, long underwear just to keep you a little warmer. So when prepping to go to the river, you might want to think about bringing a few certain things for your evening fish. One of which is some bug spray. Um, the other is actually uh, a magnifier for seeing those tiny little flies you're going to tie on, as well as a headlamp. Now the headlamp comes in um, for two purposes. One is to not only see when you're tying on flies, um, but the other is actually when you're walking back. And the reality is it's going to get dark, you're going to need to see. And let me tell you, 
um, things look a lot different in the dark. So keep that in mind, you know, pay attention to things like gates and fences and, you know, other things that um, you have to go through on your way in to get to the river um, so that you can prepare for them on the way out. And, you know, as well, um, you never know when you got those little beady eyes looking at you um, if, you're, if you're in the wilderness, if you're in the woods. So you might also want to bring along um, some bear spray. So let's talk about the actual fly fishing gear setup. You're going to want a nine foot, three to five weight rod. And that really just kind of, you know, the weight of the rod depends on the size of the fish that you're going for. Dave likes to use a four weight, I like to use a five. That's kind of just our comfort zones. Really what it comes down to is that a mid-flex rod will actually help you when it comes to actually dampening the higher line speed that you're going to need to be able to lay out an actual straight line um, leader and tip it on the water. A ten and a half foot leader is suitable. You want to start with a nine foot taper to three or four X and then you're going to add on about 18 inches of four or five X. And the biggest thing that you need to remember with the tippet is that it needs to be supple. It needs to be able to float and drift really naturally in the water. It's important to know your rise forms. Spent spinner eats are subtle dimples on the surface of the water. Spent upright wing spinners and mayfly dun eats often leave a bubble or push water droplets as the snouts break surface. Caddis eats are often slashing, or at least move more water. The point isn't to point out the other insects, but to point out the effectiveness of the two dry fly system in maximizing a firmer eat of a dun or caddis than fretting of the often unseen subtle spinner eat. You'll also need to distinguish between a dink rise and a subtle spinner rise. A larger fish will likely show at least a part of its head or tips of its lips. The biggest tell is that it will almost always move more water with a wake or a swirl, whereas a small fish will never be able to. While larger trout may dimple or sip, it likely will also show head, dorsal and tail at some point in your observations. Anglers obsess about perfection in fly patterns. While it may be needed on heavily pressured water, the reality is that the fly pattern is usually a subnote to the whole process of gear, approach, presentation, conditions, and environmental rhythm and timing. Keeping that in mind, there are four basic types of flies you need during a spinner fall. Upright wing, no hackle or trim lower hackle. Cripple upright wing, fished upright or downed splayed wing spent spinner, and caddis. Reality is that caddis also egg lay and hatch in the evenings, and having a few caddis with you will get several takes as well as serve as an excellent indicator for your small spinner. That was me, yep. Taking the caddis every time, holding wing caddis. Your best bet is to fish a double dry fly setup with one fly being a larger pattern such as a caddis or post wing mayfly, something that will be eaten but more importantly act as an indicator for the smaller, inconspicuous spinner that is almost impossible to see fish solo. The distance between the dries is important because you want the larger fly to indicate. Trout will rise extremely close to your fly and a short tippet of six inches will allow the indicator fly to do its job. The short tippet section should be a limber 5X. As evening darkens, it gets harder to see and minimizing the knots you need to tie is important. Pre-tying double dry fly setups with a lead tippet to a loop can save your entire evening for the ease of retying. We find these double dry fly combinations imitate the transition from first upright spinner hitting the water at the start of sunset to the time trout are keyed on spent spinners at dark. Small, mayfly, post wing done to emerge or cripple, caddis to spent spinner, small mayfly done, no hackle to spent spinner. The hook your fly is tied on is important. Use the best brand and beefiest metal you can get away with 
because fine wire hooks can rust out easily if you perpetually soak your fly boxes or forget to dry them. As it turns out, you shouldn't use a rusty, rusty spinner. Okay, so now that we've moved ourselves into position and we're in the same seam, same current flow as the rising fish, let's have a look at what the casting looks like. Now in my case, I'm a strong advocate for the index finger grip on the corkier rod. And the reason for that is I can put my fingertips, I always say fingertips, pointed right at the fish, and keep that finger right in line with the shoulder seam on my shirt. And that allows me basically just a short motion, short arc. I keep everything to do with my arm in front of me. I don't open that up at all. So in this case, my upper arm doesn't move. The only thing that moves, believe it or not, is my forearm. And if you look at the wrist collar on my shirt, you'll see that it has a track of about six inches or less. So let's put a rod in my hand and have a look at what that looks like. I've got my index finger pointed up the spine of the rod, and you'll notice the upper arm does not move. It'll just be basically, if you watch my wrist collar on my shirt, it'll go from about here to here to here to here, and the presentation will just be a little flick of the wrist. So let's have a look at that. And again, that's with four feet of fly line with about a 13 to 15 foot leader. And you'll notice it's fast, high, high rate of line speed. And if I want to place the fly anywhere I want to, I just simply bring my rod tip down. Sometimes we're, when we're on the tail out flats and the fish are cruising around, especially when it gets right at dusk, they're really close to you. And sometimes you only have three or four feet of fly line. And you say, well, now what? Well, you've got a long leader. Now that's when I am a strong proponent believe it or not, of mentally focusing on 12 o'clock and 8.30. And what that means is you're thinking 12 o'clock straight up and you're going to just kind of drive your line down to about 8.30. And that, this is what it looks like right here. You're thinking 12 o'clock and you're coming down to 8.30. Now, and you're probably thinking, well, aren't I driving my fly line and leader and tip it onto the water? The idea is that you've only got three or four feet of fly line, so when you go out, it's actually still in the air and it's extending and there's a built-in dampening with your wrist and with your hand. If you look down at my hand, you'll see that dampening right there. Okay, so let's have a look at what that looks like in a practical situation. Let's just get the fly line on the water and we've got that out and we're stripping to match the current. In order to loosen that fly off, the water I just raise my rod tip give a little flick and then back out now if I was actually fishing I wouldn't do that many false casts I would just raise loosen up bad cast and on the water and if I'm not talking and filming I'm actually fishing I'll just roll it snap at one o'clock and back out in the water and that's as simple as that cast can be again just flip up one o'clock pause on the water loosen flip pause on the water it's that simple. Now, if we're gonna choke up and the fish are even closer, and you've only got two feet of fly line with a 14 foot leader, well, that's even easier, but you need line speed right there. Believe it or not, you have high line speed, little flip on the water. Okay, so let's talk about something else with casting that affects everybody as the light goes away every night. And that is you're trying to see. Uh, it's way bright right now, but as it gets dark, you start to lean. And what happens when you start to lean into your cast, you're, you're trying to find it, you're trying to find it, and now look at this, open, out. And you start to creep and jab. And what happens when you creep and jab is your rod tip goes too far back, then you try to force it, and your force, well your axis now, is throwing your front cast at 10 o'clock instead of driving it down accurately to eight. Let's talk about your casting plane on shoreline casts. The classic 10 and 2 cast has that line traveling horizontal to the water. And that's great, except if you do that on a really short cast, what's going to happen 10 2, 10 2, 10 2, any kind of wind, and your fly and line are going to arc about 10 feet to the right of where you're trying to cast. So that's why I like to have my casting plane on a slight downward trajectory. And what that looks like with line speed is just slightly down. 
and that gets me onto the water right there perfectly straight perfectly laid out if I again if I leave that to 10 and 2 10 and 2 with any kind of raised arm like a lot of people do you're just throwing that and because there's no weight in your fly line uh, carrying your energy through your leader into uh, to the fly literally if there's any wind out there you'll get owned and you'll be nowhere near where you're trying to cast okay so it's time to have a hard talk if your position and approach is 20 percent off if your casting is 20 percent off if your line control is 20 percent off and your hook set is 20 percent off you now have left yourself a compound of 40 percent probability or chance of catching a fish and that's why I tell people you have to hone in, you have to really look at what you're doing. If something's amiss, you're going to miss. So it's best to have an honest look at what you're doing, hone each component that we talk about here in, and really make a concerted effort to correct everything to give yourself the best chance. Because if we start to look at mouth structure on fish and the hook gap and hook size on the flies that we're using, you're already starting at a 50% chance and probability of hooking the fish and if you then take the remaining 50% and only give yourself a 40%, you're operating at about 20% chance of landing that fish. So let's really make sure you take the time to hone in and do your best homework before you get to the water and have a great evening on the water. The great news is that because of low light, trout are generally less spooky than in full daylight and casting errors are dampened. When targeting structure-loving brown trout, it's often simply a game of being accurate with your cast and drifting into its feeding lane. However, when it comes to rainbows and their propensity to search and hunt feet per second, accuracy goes hand in hand with timing and speed of delivery. Your fly needs to be delivered promptly. A tightened casting arc and increased line speed cuts one to two seconds on fly delivery. If a trout rises then searches, it may well be three feet away in three seconds on a casual search. If you can roll, load, and shoot in a second to lead trout by six inches, you'll have a decided advantage over longer arc casts that take twice as long to deliver, let alone if it leads trout by 18 inches to two feet. It's extremely important to target one trout at a time. While a shotgun approach might work, it doesn't allow you to hone in and see if what you're doing is best. And try to target trout that are feeding in line with the current. Trout that are feeding in a searching pattern, several feet left or right are difficult to pinpoint. Again, if that's what you have, then you'll have to tighten your casting stroke. Because casts are accurate and drift short, men should seldom be required. If you lead the fish by a foot, there's little need to mend. If you find yourself casting long distances that require mending, you need to move your feet and position within the 20 foot red zone in the same current. If you're in a situation of longer casts or crossing seams, the on water mending simply can't move the fly or change its drift at all. As Dave just shared, we have to check our emotions in order that we can be methodical and consistent in our approach. Everything we do is slow and deliberate with little sound. Motion is minimized when engaged with trout in feeding lies during the spinnerfall. Don't show up to a preferred runner reach of water too early, as the temptation will be to go after the first to show, rather than allowing the full event to get the attention of all trout in the run. Force yourself to wait at least 15 minutes before you cross a tail out flat to chase that big riser. It may well turn out that big riser is the smallest one to show tonight. Be patient. On a hot summer day like this, 
Instead of forcing the issue of catching one fish, I like to take 15 minutes to study the run where I'll be fishing the spinnerfall. Try to know the water and its features. If it's a hot sunny day, rather than plug a run with streamers or nymphing, take 15 minutes to observe where the troughs, undercuts, depressions, riffles, logs, rocks, and any other features likely to have holding trout. Those are the places to specifically observe when the spinnerfall begins. A little research will help identify the most likely microhabitats and maximize your efforts. Your fishing location has to be the highest contrast. The best location is to stare into the fading light to have the highest glare on the water. This allows you to see insects and risers as they will appear as dark silhouettes against the light. Black on silver is your best friend. Side or downstream approaches and presentations may be required on pressured streams or when angles of light simply don't allow you to see. Keep in mind that if you fish downstream to a trout, when it comes time to lift and cast again, you may be doing so over the fish. Downstream drifts to trout also risk pulling the fly straight out of its mouth upon the hook set. Find what presentation angle works best on your water. If you have to walk around trout to get into position, do so well around the stream edge, concealed by bush. The reality is that the slower, more methodical and deliberate you are with your approach and pace, you'll place yourself amongst trout and perfectly positioned to catch them effortlessly. When you look at the mouth structure of large trout and then look at the hook gap and strength of small hooks, it's already a 50-50 proposition of getting a good hook set. There are too many things that can go wrong simply considering micro currents pushing the fly this way or that, the fish pushing the fly in the water's meniscal layer, and the fly drifting through the hook in its mouth. You'll simply never hook up every large trout you encounter. All we can do is use a fly with as big a hook cap as the trout will tolerate and ensure the hook is sharp. From there, we have to present the flies with a straight line to avoid the need to mend, strip line to match the current, and have a controlled, firm lift to set the hook. Ripping hook sets come from a poor cast and are compounded by poor line control, leading to the need to rip the rod and line in compensation. These hook sets seldom stick. If you find yourself missing the set on more than half the takes, your line control needs work.
Oh, did you see that one that's straight in front of you? That's the one I was referring. There you go. That should do it. That was the line I saw him in. Yeah, but I was two seconds late, eh? Right. So, he could have moved three, four feet in that time. Yeah. There he is, and he did. He moved two feet left. Ooh, right here. Right in front of you. Got my eyes on the water, my peripheral on my flies. Yep. He's just ahead of you, hey? Yeah, just ahead of me. I'm gonna wait. He's popping straight upstream. I'm gonna okay. wait for one more rise and place this. There's two coming together. I just gotta wait for one rise here. Right here. Yeah, my Oh! I was just gonna say my fly's nunchuck. My 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 top dry fly was here and the current swung my spinner. And I was giving up on the cast, and that's, of course, when he ate it. <laughs> of course. Okay, just going to wait for this guy. He's right facing upstream. Just going to wait for one more rise and lay it out. That's a, just a little dimple. I'm, I'm just waiting. Come on, bud. Right there. Six inches short. Just a little lift, flick, and on the water. Is he going to come a foot to the left? No, after <laughs> Just me. Here we go. moved upstream a bit, eh? Yeah. Oh, right there. Oh. I was way too fast because he popped on the fly instead of a sip. That caused me to go thunk. And that was that. So your hook set can't be lightning quick. It just has to be firm. Anytime you find yourself ripping, it's, well, it's over. <laughs> oh, well. Consistency is your ally. A warm, calm day with an increasing warm cloud bank is the best situation as the insulating cloud will prevent temperatures from plummeting and encourage a longer egg-laying event later into the evening. Heavier changing winds and thunderstorms are non-starters. Check your weather radar and forecast for any chance of a cell rolling through. If the temperature drops too drastically or the wind howls, it usually kills this event. Remember, these are tiny, skinny insects, and a degree is a massive swing. If it's to be windy, you'll need to find a bush line section of stream. Heavy spinner events can happen in 40 yards of stream, and you might need to search for it on a windy evening. If you find a perfectly protected pocket, it can simply fire. So right in there in that second stick, just behind that, that's where that fish is holding. And let's just set up and wait for that head. There he is there. Ever so subtle, but that's probably a 17 to 19 inch rainbow. Nose right in. And again, he'll go to the shore side and out and back again, simply because that wind is blowing right to left really hard. And those mayflies are just getting blown across the river. And, and while it's not a heavy spinner fall, you have a situation that everything that's coming down the river is blown over to this side. So normally you wouldn't want a big wind during a spinner fall, but tonight um, we've got a summer night and the mayfly spinners are coming. If I look the other way, it's just nothing but spinners in the air. The blessing is we've got a right to left, right to left wind 
and it's blowing all the spinners into this bank and right up the shoreline there's one two three four fish in the seam and in behind each one of these sticks is a really nice fish and so basically i just have to come up this bank real slow get right behind a real short cast and just pop it in there i have to keep my line speed up i have to keep everything all my mechanics smooth and i have to get this fly right off that first stick just off the seam there and it's going to take a little bit of time to get in the right position but it's better to be in the same seam as the fish on a short line cast doing everything right to maximize your chance of getting hooked up on these small flies. Okay, so that was awesome. Let's keep going. It's exciting. It's just pop, pop, pop. And yeah, I'm just gonna sneak up the shoreline again uh, and just go as excited as I am. Cause I'm, 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 you know, the vibration, you know, the Jensen vibration, totally buzzing. But I'm smart enough to overcome my emotions and slowly walk up, methodically get in position. Locating rising trout sounds simple, but the subtlety of it during the spinner fall, thanks to the micro location and sipping rises, leave many anglers missing the rise. The largest fish tend to be nosed into the shallow edges of a shelf at the head of a run, tight to structure in shallow edges, or in a slight tailout depression. These are deceptively shallow water with slow flows. Otherwise, reading trout water is consistent. Find the seams, as subtle as they may be, as they're associated with structure and edge definition of bottom features. In moderate to fast water, fish will station, or at least associate themselves to a home feature such as a rock, shelf, or stick. While they'll move two or three feet out to feed, they'll come back to tag home base cover before searching out again. Other trout with a hard feature will simply sit in a pillow or pocket expelling little energy while dimpling up to feed. On glides and flats, you'll often encounter cycling or searching trout. Careful observation is needed to avoid lining these fish as spook trout may bolt and tip off the other fish. If you find yourself not catching trout, 
but they keep rising and you're slowly walking upstream chasing and pushing them. It's a solid tell that your approach, casting, line control, or delicacy of line and fly arrival need improving. As the spinner fall wanes, fish will slowly cease rising. Now it's time to look for collection zones of eddies, backwaters, and other soft water pockets where fish have moved to feed. So the wind hasn't quit, it's not our favorite. And the other thing is the water levels are up about 15 or 20 percent over the last few days. So all that combined, that wind is still coming across like that. And as I stand here, there's just mayfly spinners coming at me and Basically, everything that's dropping to the water is getting pushed and blown to this shore. There's nothing rising across the river. Everything that's rising is right here, and you can see all the spinners in the air. The fish, there's at least four or five fish that are, that are popping in this seam, and that's all because all the food is getting blown over to this side. The water levels are up, and these fish are just nosed into that collection point. Uh, on the inside of that seam. If I sound like I'm stuttering, I just realized there's easily a 22, 23 inch rainbow rising right there. I have a choice, do I work my way up and risk spooking the big one by hooking and playing the small ones, like that one right there, or do I just sneak around, which I'm going to do, and get in behind that, uh, the clover there and just try to dap a cast in and try to hook up the big one. Guess what we're doing. Time is your most valuable commodity during spinner falls. There's never enough. Fish will rise extremely close to your fly. If you cast four or five times to a lined up trout, then you need to change something. Tippet size, fly size, single fly only. Be decisive and make the change expeditiously. One of the most important skills in fishing small dry flies is learning the art of spotting refusals. These are all examples of trout swinging to look at the dry fly, but refusing it at the last second. Keep a keen eye on boils and squirrels tied to your fly. While one drift might be refused due to a curling micro drag of your fly, successive swirls indicate it's time to change the pattern, size, or tippet. A near impossible skill to master is seeing your takes at all times. 
The two dry fly system is set up to help alleviate this, but you're still going to miss a few eats. Try to take ownership of the possibility because if that trout ate once already, it gets exponentially more difficult to fool again. Missed hook sets are always a touchy thing. We so often want to believe that fish didn't feel the hook. Chances are that it did. The point here is to know when to cut off your engagement with a riser that you missed in favor of the next riser. Most of us have too much hope and want to believe we can convince that fish to eat again. And if it begins rising consistently once more, you may well be right. But with 20 minutes of light left, you'll want to make a decision to target the next riser. Missed fish are too often teases born straight out of the depths of tantalus. Fishing the evening spinner fall is like every other fly fishing opportunity. You can lose yourself to the minutia of technicalities if you'd like to, or you could just stick to the basics as we've shared here and have a go. It's up to you. It offers solitude or opportunity to share a tail out flat with friends. Yeah, so he's just been rising really tight in, in front of me here, Dave. Yeah, I'll just get him behind you. Okay. okay. Let's see. Not too far up, eh? No, like a couple like, rod lengths. Get that? Oh, yeah, right, right, right here. here. Right. Yeah. Okay. You got it. that line speed up, yeah. stop, and see what it does with that. I can't see. Can you? Oh, I'm short. Short mm -hmm. line, about two feet. Snap yeah. it. Right there. Come on, you can try to go. Yeah. Look at that, eh? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? That's yeah. just awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's better. Keep it tight. There we go. Okay. 